Right, thank you very much for joining us today, everybody. Um, we're here for the free Money for LEDs session, uh, one of the last sessions at Q2017, so thank you for joining us and sticking around. Everybody had a good few days so far? Yeah. All right, yeah, we've got to like, have a big raucous like, cheer and stuff so that everybody <laughs> watching on the live stream thinks there's millions of people here. Yes, but it's hard to do with, that, with 10 people. And it's hard to do with 10 people, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my name is Chris Patton. I'm the Architectural Luminaires Product Manager at ETC. Uh, currently based out of the New York office, but soon be relocating here to the Madison area. So, uh, just getting my head around the space and uh, enjoying the beautiful scenery of, uh, of Wisconsin. How many people have, uh, is this first trip to Wisconsin? Or would you guys move here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to my right is Jen Christensen. Uh, Jen, say hi. Hi, Jen Christensen. I am the Field Project Coordinator out of Orlando. So uh, each region has one of these lovely people. If you have seen anything during Q that you want to see closer or get a demo of, uh, you can contact your local field project coordinator. Very good. Today, Shameless plug. <laughs> today's session uh, is about energy incentives, financial incentives that you might find from your energy utility. I know in the room and probably on the live stream as well, we have a few people that are outside, from, uh, outside of North America, particularly uh, the US itself. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, some of this stuff is relevant, although a lot of the references in this are specific to the U.S. So we're going to be talking um, about uh, incentives that you may be able to find and resources you can find within the U.S. mainly. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff is, is obviously uh, localized to that kind of thing. But um, you may find that you can, uh, you can find and re do your own research and find similar kinds of incentives in your local area as well. So stick with us on this. It is relevant. Um, but um, I'm going to make a lot of examples and references to things within the U.S., particularly New York, which is where uh, the office I'm currently based out of. So we're going to rely on some of the information we got from Con Edison, which are the, uh, the local energy provider in the, uh, the New York City area. Um, we're going to be covering a few things today. Um, why do power companies give away money is going to be the first topic. Um, I wasn't really sure myself about this. I started researching this particular topic about 18 months ago, and it kind of seemed weird to me that energy companies would want to part with cash. You know, you'd think they want to sell you more energy and take more cash off you. So why are they so keen to uh, start writing checks for, um, uh, for products that you may want to put into your building that are essentially going to reduce the amount of product that you need to get from the energy, incentive, uh, from the energy utility. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the types of incentives and programs that are available. There are lots, actually, um, of, of uh, incentives and programs, but um, we'll look at a, a few of the more popular ones and the specifics that go into that. Uh, the process, let's assume you find something that you really like in terms of uh, energy uh, program, incentive program, and you want to take advantage of that, we're going to talk about the typical process that goes, uh, that, you, that you're going to be looking at and faced with. Um, uh, tax incentives, there is a tax incentive available, I'll talk a bit about that, it's kind of weird because it's kind of gone away, but it might come back, so we'll talk a little bit about that and that will make sense very shortly. Uh, product qualification, uh, this is all to do with the tests and the types of material um, that you're likely to be asked for by the energy companies when you're applying and looking to take part in these incentives. Um, Jen's also going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the different types of uh, programs for us as manufacturers taking product to be um, uh, tested and uh, analyzed so that uh, it could be, they can produce the documentation that's required. A lot of that is done out of house. We don't generally do it ourselves. It goes to an independently and nationally recognized test laboratory. Uh, some of the barriers that might be involved, and, uh, and also at the end of this session, I have a case study um, of a, an installation we did up in Canada um, a couple of years ago. The guys up in the uh, Centennial Console very kindly agreed to let me use them as a, a case study, and that hopefully will help you understand with a real-life example of, uh, the, of what they went through in order to secure some funding, uh, what they actually did, um, and, and how they handled the situation. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, I know um, uh, this is being live streamed, but uh, I would encourage you in the room right here, if you have experience of um, working on, a, on an energy incentive uh, application and maybe being successful with that, or even if you weren't successful with that, it would be interesting to hear from you and share that with the room. I'll relay some of this information as well so those watching online can listen to it. Um, and actually, uh, if we can, we can all learn from each other's experiences as well. So maybe there's no one, but if there is, then feel free to share that, maybe towards the end of the session as well. Hoping this session will be uh, around, uh, around an hour, maybe slightly less, depending on uh, how much, how collaborative we were, we're feeling and how many people have got to rush to the airport to get home. Right, so let's kick things off. Why do power companies want to part with their 
their good cash, their good money to uh, write checks to the likes of us for putting new products and fixtures into our brand new or even, uh, or, or even renovating existing venues and facilities. Well, here's the thing. Uh, energy demand is an all-time high. Um, we, uh, if you look at the charts, and a lot of this information comes from uh, the government, online government um, uh, resources such as the Energy Information Administration um, and, uh, and several other online resources, which is all public information. You can research this. Um, over the last few years, we've seen a fairly steady trend upwards, and what the energy companies are trying to do is, uh, is trying to reduce that upwards trend. And the main reason for that um, is electrical infrastructure is pretty expensive. Um, it's actually millions and billions of dollars in some case um, to, to build new power generation plant, uh, to build infrastructure and grid equipment, um, and just locally to maintain and service that from, uh, from source right to the end users such as us in our facilities and even in domestic homes. Um, uh, one example that I often use, and this is a, a well-documented example, in New York City itself back in 2013, the peak demand that those guys ever saw uh, on one particular day, it was a series of about five days of extremely high temperatures. Um, and it got to uh, about the fifth day of that, and at five o'clock one afternoon in a, on a sunny July afternoon back in 2013, the, uh, the peak New York grid uh, demand came up to uh, 13,322 megawatts for one hour. So what New York City, what Con Edison had to do, and all the energy infrastructure surrounded that had to do, was to plan uh, for that requirement, that peak demand, and put in infrastructure and spend huge amounts of money in getting that ready for uh, a high peak demand of energy consumption for one hour. Obviously, they need to have, be supplying more than we're actually consuming, otherwise you run into all kinds of brownout issues. So it's a very expensive thing to do when, for most of the year, the peak demand of the, of the energy grid is actually much lower. So that's the main reason. It's actually cheaper for an energy company or energy companies to write us checks to reduce the amount of power that we want to use than it is to invest in new energy generating and uh, energy generating facilities and, and infrastructure. Make sense? Uh, there's obviously environmental concerns about reducing power as well. I think we all agree that reducing reliance on fossil fuels is a good thing. Um, Anybody want to hazard a guess on, uh, on where, we, where we are with renewable energy consumption in terms of percentage across the entire United States? Anybody want to hazard a guess on how, how much we're actually, how, what percentage of the total requirement is down to renewable energy? Four percent. How many? Four. Four. Actually, a little bit more than four. Um, we're actually looking at uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, depending on the things you look at. But 4 percent might come down into things like um, hydropower, you know. So you might find that around 4 percent is hydropower, Na uh, get, uh, uh, um, wind turbine, wind power. Um, things like uh, biomass and uh, geothermal energy are also factor into that. But a fairly low number overall. Um, until last year, I think it was, coal was the highest, fo the highest amount of fossil fuel at about 34 percent. Um, and actually natural gas was slightly behind. That's kind of flipped now. So natural gas is slightly ahead and coal is very slightly underneath that. Nuclear max makes up about 20% of the, uh, of the uh, requirement as well. So uh, we still got a long way to go in actually uh, reducing the uh, reliance on fossil fuels in, in generating power. So environmental concern do factor into this, um, but all these things combined really are the reasons why uh, energy generating companies want to reduce uh, their peak demand on the grid. So that's why. So let's take a look at the types of incentives that are available. The first, I'm going to choose three here, three key ones, and these are probably the most common things. Um, the first thing is an equipment rebate program. And what this means is, quite simply, you might be using old, outdated equipment, and it's not very efficient, and it's actually better just to be using the same thing but a newer version of it. And uh, the power companies may pay for you to just take that old one away and re re replace it with the same or better uh, equivalent. Now, this quite often applies to things like HVAC systems, refrigerators, you know, um, you know, cooking equipment, commercial cooking equipment, that kind of thing. But across the board, and dependent on area by area and um, by different utilities, you might find that this applies to uh, different types of equipment, and particularly things that may be more relevant into, um, in, into our industries as well, really depends on the utility itself. Um, so equipment rebate programs, again, uh, in the Con Edison area, um, kind of reduced peak, recent peak uh, demand by about 184 megawatts. So, and that's just replacing the same amount of equipment there just for a better, more efficient version of it. So that kind of has a good effect as well. Demand response programs. Uh, everybody familiar with demand response? You, no one heard of demand response before? 
Okay, a few people in the room haven't heard of demand response. Now, what this means is uh, you can continue to use the existing equipment you have, but you can enter into an agreement with the company that is supplying your energy and say, okay, well, we agree that when peak demand is really high, we will reduce as a facility our energy usage. And in return for that peak reduction in energy usage, we will expect to receive an incentive for doing that. So, um, and that varies. I mean, there are a few different versions of that. Sometimes there are 12-hour energy response times or 24-hour energy response times where the power utility will contact you if you're a participant in this program and say, we're forecasting peak demand tomorrow at 5 p.m., so we'd like to initiate our peak, uh, peak demand, demand response program um, from 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. Uh, here's your 24 hours notice, and you've got to go 30%, use 30% less energy as a facility. Uh, and if you comply with that, you're going to see uh, an incentive, a financial incentive from your energy bill. And if you don't comply with that, then depending on the agreement you may have with the utility, you may, uh, may not be able to do the scheme anymore, or you may have um, uh, a penalty for not reducing as, as agreed. So a lot of people are also using technology to assist with um, demand response. Uh, anybody, uh, anybody think of an ETC product that may, uh, has demand response input? Net3 conductor, another one, echo room controller. Uh, these have got inputs into the system itself, uh, which is normally like a closed contact input. And some of the newer metering equipment and energy, uh, energy utility supply equipment that sits in the plant room of the facility will have uh, interfaces that will connect with things like conductor and uh, echo room controller. And when the energy company initiates a demand response uh, program call, it will actually send out a closed contact input into a room controller to go to a preset level. So potentially in a room like this, we could see uh, the echo room controller going, oh, I've just received the demand response. I'm going to reduce the energy consumption and the light levels by 30 or 40 percent in order to comply with the demand response. When the time frame has elapsed, then the demand response trigger goes away and the room can go back to normal. And that's what demand response is, just proactively reducing the amount of energy you use. Uh, the other thing we have are things like, uh, you know, control systems, architectural control systems such as uh, Paradigm, Echo, um, to actually change behavioral aspects of the way we use architectural lighting. So maybe we have, uh, in an auditorium kind of uh, capacity, the cleaners may come in at uh, 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. They need to turn on all the lights to do their job. But rather than leaving the room at the end of that hour, hour and a half cleaning session, um, and leaving the lights on, burning through energy on a daily basis, we can actually set up things like architectural control systems to reduce the amount of light that's being used in a given area. And that may be on a timeout kind of basis. It may be on an occupancy sensor kind of basis where the technology just detects if there's someone in the room and then shuts it down over time. Um, and that could be for an entire room, or it could even be for specific areas. I mean, we're dealing with LED lighting now, which is uniquely addressable on a per-fixture basis. And that allows us to say, well, let's just turn off the lighting over the seating in the auditorium, and we'll just light the doorways, the walkways, and the surrounding access points for safety reasons. But we're still actually reducing the overall amount of energy we're using. So combining things together in demand response programs, such as complying with the utility, coupled with behavioral changes, and using technologies for our advantage can help reduce the energy footprint. That's another kind of incentive available from, uh, from power utilities, or a common kind of incentive. The third one, and this is the one that's really interesting to us in our, uh, in our industry, because the majority of the products that we use in our industry isn't even compliant for, uh, the, for the large number of uh, programs that are available. Um, and that's because in most cases, you're talking about um, high volume products. So the energy companies want to know that, oh, well, you know what, we'll reduce 10 million um, washing machine uh, the power requirement of 10 million washing machines or, or HVAC systems that are out of date, and that will have a huge effect. Um, but that doesn't mean that in, a, say, a performance venue, um, actually going more energy efficient either on stage or in the auditorium or the architectural areas won't have the same effect. You know, you only need a few larger venues uh, to start using more efficient lighting equipment, and you can have a pretty substantial impact on the energy requirement as well. That doesn't go away. I mean, let's, let's consider the core goal for the energy utilities here is to reduce their peak demand, right? So um, what we need to do is demonstrate to the energy utilities that when we found one of these programs available, that our product qualifies and is suitable, even if it doesn't carry one of the more recognized um, energy 
compliance stickers or labels, such as Energy Star or DLC is another one. And I won't go into detail on that now because Jen's going to cover that very shortly. Um, so one of the things we can do with the custom programs in order to take advantage of these, um, uh, these use our products in these custom programs is something called alternative product qualification or APQ is often referred to. Um, and this just basically means that we go to a utility company and we say, we see you guys have got a, uh, an energy program incentive available. We really like to take advantage of that. Um, we see that typically speaking, you need Energy Star or you need DLC listing or some other kind of documentation in order to prove that the products, uh, the products are uh, legitimate and viable uh, for this particular type of use. But we don't really have that. So, but what we do have is a whole range of testing um, and other reports that we go through as a manufacturer, some of which are not even really required from a legal standpoint, but we choose to do that anyway. And what we can do with this is put a, a case study together to demonstrate to the energy utility that, hey, you know what, our architectural uh, LED fixtures we're using in the auditorium, or maybe even on stage in certain, um, certain programs, um, is still going to have uh, a good impact in the energy reduction um, and going to allow us to meet our goal of reducing energy. So, you know, I think it would be really good if you guys wrote us a check so that we can go ahead and buy $5 million worth of equipment from ETC. <laughs> Um, the, amount of, the amount of programs that are avail uh, available really uh, vary by utility, and um, we have some resources that are available, um, and those of you that are here right now are going to receive a thumb drive with the, um, some links on it, and there's, there's going to be some information there. What we'll obviously have to do is publish information on our website for the people online. Um, and what this allows you to do is put in some information by state or your zip code, and it will tell you, you know, what... Um, what, what's available from a, from a federal level, from a local level, that kind of thing. So the first part of this is identifying who to go and speak to at your energy utility. Once you've uh, maybe identified the programs that are available, uh, then go and find the right person at, the, at that company, at that utility to speak to and put your case forward. Because in most cases, if you're speaking to uh, an administrative type person that uh, may be handling a program, then the first thing they may do, not in all cases, but they may do is say, does the product you want to use conform to Energy Star or DLC? The answer may be, well, no. Uh, and that may be the end of it. But there is some persistence required here. And what I would encourage you to do if you've run into these roadblocks before is find the facilities manager of your venue. Perhaps that person would have an account manager at the utility company, and going that path to talk to the, to the right person may, result in, uh, may have a better result. Um, it does vary, but uh, you know, some, sometimes, as I say, some persistence is required. And uh, we'll obviously help you with that as well in providing you um, with the documentation that may be required. Uh, and again, Jen's going to talk about some of the documentation that we can help you with. Let's talk about the process. So a typical process, you've, you've identified the incentive you want to use, you've eventually got through to the right person, um, and they say, okay, we think uh, you've got some product here that, um, that we would be happy to, to help you with in installing in your venue in order to reduce the amount of energy you're going to be using. Um, so the first thing to do is, is to apply. There's the usual paperwork that you have to fill in for anything these days. Um, there's probably going to be some kind of assessment of the product that wants to be used, particularly if we're dealing with things that don't have one of those recognized marks that we were talking about. Um, so that may take some time as well. Um, typically, there may be a site visit. Depending on the scope and the size of the project involved, it may mean that somebody from the utility needs to physically come down to your venue, uh, look at the space that you're interested in upgrading or modifying, um, understand it, and make sure that the uh, what you're claiming you're drawing now in terms of energy is correct, and sometimes they may put some metering equipment as well on the, on the, uh, on the main intake to the building or locally on a branch circuit somewhere just to, to, to prove and document that the energy you're using is, is what you say. Um, and then ultimately, they're going to offer a pre-approval. It's kind of like a mortgage, really. You know, you're making an application. They're going to say, yep, okay, well, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can work with you on this, and they're going to offer you a, a pre-approval. The next thing is to install the product. You've had your pre-approval. Uh, sometimes there's a time limit on this kind of thing. They don't last forever. Um, you know, I've seen them as short as three months, as long as a year. Um, somewhere in between six months, maybe, is about the going rate. Um, sometimes, and this is something you, you may need to watch out for, is that you need to use a contractor to do the installation that has been pre-approved by the utility company themselves. Uh, I know, again, in the, um, the New York service area, uh, there is a green team. Um, and again, this is all Googleable. I don't know if that's a word, Googleable, but I like it. Um, and you can check out the, the list of preferred market partners, um, and they will 
uh, provide to you those that have been vetted, make sure they're legitimate companies. The same thing could apply around other parts of the country and even the world as well, depending on the program. Uh, and then that uh, part, uh, ultimately comes out, performs the installation, and uh, the next part is to try and get the money out of the uh, energy utility, right? So that is a verification phase and probably involves another site visit to come back um, where the energy utility company are going to want to install a second round of metering equipment if they didn't leave it in from the first time. And over a period of time, typically maybe two to four weeks, they're going to say, well, it does look like you know, what you said you were going to do, you've delivered upon, and you've reduced your energy and uh, peak demand by, this, by, the, by the amount that you stated. Uh, so congratulations, here's your incentive. And the amount of that incentive uh, really varies as well. Can be uh, anything, uh, you know, well, anything from nothing, up to typically about 50% match funding. So, and whether or not that covers things like installation labor varies by program as well. Sometimes we see things just covering the product itself, and sometimes we even see them say, well, we'll cover your installation labor. Uh, we may even cover internal staff time as well, and that's just in preparation for the project itself. Maybe you've hired an external consultant to come in and evaluate the current uh, installation and, and what you would hope to achieve, and maybe there are costs involved in that, and sometimes they'll be covered as well. So, you know, again, the, uh, the information will obviously be in the fine print and in the details from the, from the company, but you can really end up uh, with some serious incentives back on this. And let's not forget, even if we're installing LED equipment in place of incandescent equipment that's going to reduce your peak energy demand, that's still going to be a financial benefit. That's still going to reduce the amount of money you're paying on your energy bill. Um, so it's, it doesn't mean that even if you don't get uh, an energy incentive from the power utility company, it's not worth doing this, assuming you have the capital uh, available in the bank to be able to spend on the, on the equipment in the first place. But um, these, these incentives really just help speed the process up. You know, the return on investment time frame is going to be much faster if you can get one of these incentives. I mentioned earlier that we have a tax incentive available. Um, well, we actually, we don't. We did um, here in America. It's Section 179D. It actually just relates to government buildings, generally speaking. So uh, state schools and other government uh, utilities, that kind of thing. Um, and what it does is allows building owners uh, to take a tax deduction um, of up to about $1.80 per square foot, um, depending on the amount of um, work they're doing on on the project at any one time. Now, typically, that means you have got to look at your HVAC and your, uh, your, uh, your heating and, um, and also your lighting equipment as well. Um, and it proportionately reduces dependent on uh, whether you're just doing a lighting project. Um, but at the end of the day, there are tax incentives and reductions available. Now, here's the thing. This actually ran out at the end of 2016. So why am I mentioning it now? Well, it may well come back. There are currently four bills um, in process under consideration at the moment to reinstate 179D. Will it happen? Who knows? But um, I mention it now because it may be applicable to some people in the room. We put this again into the uh, resource pack that accompanies this class online. And so if you are a government facility, if you work in a government facility, it's something you may want to look up and see how this progresses over the course of the next few months. All right. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Jen, who's going to talk to you about some of the uh, standards and paperwork that are involved and in how we may be able to help you in an application like this. So anytime we're applying for any of those custom rebates, there are some things that your power company is going to want to get from you. They're not just going to say, oh, hey, that fixture looks lovely, and uh, here's some money. They want proof. So some of the tests that we do and that they require, one of them is the LM79 test. And this is done by a third party. We don't do this testing. Um, and it evaluates the efficacy of the LED uh, fixture. Um, it measures your wattage used, your lumen output, um, and also tests if we're using the LED in the way the LED manufacturer recommends. Um, and this is kind of what the LM79 report looks like. And that's just the up close of that. Um, we also do in situ testing. Um, so this is going to evaluate the manufacturing uh, testing, uh, verifies that all the LEDs are being used within the manufacturer specif specifications, um, and this also can factor into uh, the life of the LED and what we're claiming. And so in this test, you see we get pictures of the boards, things get tested at different temperatures. 
So the, Chris mentioned the DLC and Energy Star. So DLC and Energy Star have evaluated products, and most of your energy companies will say, hey, does it have one of these stamps on it? It means that it's already been evaluated. Um, with our uh, LED fixtures for entertainment, uh, we do have some of these problems that can come about. Um, the L70 rating of a fixture is essentially how long um, that fixture will shine till it's to 70% of its original output. So that's a test that takes anywhere from 6,000 plus hours to do that test. Um, so it takes a long time, but once we do that test, we're able to say, we're able to use math from the IES that tells us that how, how long that fixture will last until it hits that 70%. Um, with DLC, you need to have a minim minimum L70 rating of 50,000 hours. We get this from our LED manufacturers, and as long as we are constructing our fixture in such a way that it is not overpowered or um, undercooled, we should get that amount of life out of it. Initially, with our um, LED fixtures for stage lighting, uh, the Series 2 LED, our color source fixture, source forward, we were being very conservative with those tests, and so we were saying that we had 20,000 hours. We have gone back and tested um, the Series 2 luster and the color source uh, fixture, the color source spot, and those are now rated at 54,000 hours. So we end up, we're actually getting a whole lot more life out of them than we thought we would. Um, they also require a minimum five-year warranty. Uh, by default, ETC for our stage fixtures gives a three-year warranty. When you're purchasing, you can look into extended warranty options, though. Um, and they require a minimum of 45 lumens per watt at all times. So when we're doing those bright colors, we're going... Um, we don't have that efficacy. So the lumens per watt is lumens, uh, the amount of lumens per the power you're drawing. So ours doesn't necessarily go that uh, low. Uh, and it's intended for white light fixtures. So when we're looking at LED fixtures and how we have colors turned on at different intensities and different times, that's another reason why we're not hitting that efficacy point necessarily for DLC. So this is one of their tables that you can look at for different lighting. And we fall under this uh, interior directional. And so these are the points that we would have to hit to be DLC certified. And like I said, we don't hit that efficacy point. Oy. Um, Energy Star is the other one. This is mostly um, a consumer and commercial uh, stamp that you get. So this is going to be all of your TVs, your refrigerator, your dishwasher, your washing machine. Uh, they come with that cute little Energy Star certification on them. Uh, entertainment lighting is prohibited by this, uh, and they have very high standards for the efficacy like the DLC does. So one of the other things that Energy Star looks at is that minimum wattage draw in the off state. And since we're powering our um, power supplies, even when the light isn't turned on, we're drawing more than that. Um, do you know what that, you said the it was like? Half a watt. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, it's interesting, the, um, the quiescent load or the vampire load that we often see on various products. Um, you know, I have a DVR, a set-top box for my cable TV at home, and that's got an Energy Star sticker on the front of it, and I can guarantee that draws more than half watt in its standby mode. Um, but because it's got a menu option that says something along the lines of go to deep sleep after it's not been used for 30 minutes, that means it qualifies for Energy Star. Now, it's not much use to me if it goes to deep sleep after 30 minutes because it doesn't record anything. But because it has the option in order to do that, it means that uh, it qualifies for Energy Star. So there are ways and means around um, you doing it or providing an option. If you choose to use it as a user, then that's one thing. Um, but that's sometimes some of the problems we run into. It's a very strict criteria, and really, Energy Star itself, as Jen said, is geared towards the consumer level, um, and, uh, and we are not really a consumer product. So this is 
uh, Energy Star. So under the not eligible to earn Energy Star, uh, we fall under party and entertainment lighting, and this is where I wanted to do a big light chase, but <laughs> we didn't get to do that. So what can we do? Uh, for our stage lighting fixtures, custom rebates are really the way to go. Um, I know in the southeast, uh, my territory, Georgia Power already has pre-approved our fixtures uh, for their rebate programs. Um, as Chris was saying, it would require, you're going to require that site survey, a list of what you're currently using, how much power that takes, um, a list of what you're planning to put in place, as well as how much power that's going to take, um, cost of the replacement gear, sometimes cost of installation, um, your man hours, consultants man hours, all of that can be kind of bundled in there depending on what your particular energy company is going to require. Um, and then also the detailed information on the efficacy of your replacement gear and your LM79 in situ and LM80 tests. So how can we help with that? Um, ETC has all of this information in a energy rebate package. So if you go on our website, there is the energy rebate package that you can look up and hand all of this information to your power company. Um, for those of you in the room, it's also on your thumb drive. So you already have that information, but is publicly available on our website. And in this, it's going to give you all of that information that they would ask for. Uh, if they do need more information, you can contact someone like me, uh, your field project coordinator, that even if I don't have the answers, I can get you in touch with the correct person. We can help you talk to the power company to try and maximize those uh, rebate options. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we're going to move on now a little bit. One of the things, just to follow on from that, um, I've been working on a few of these uh, requirements from the energy utility companies. Typically what they ask me for when they're looking at a project and considering an alternative product qualification, LM79, LM80, they may, if you're using a recessed architectural fixture, want a plenum listing report. And a plenum listing, for those that don't know, is when you're looking at using, using a, maybe a recessed fixture in an air handling space. And that's just typically, if there was a fire, how much toxic smoke um, would be released into the air handling system. Um, and so, I mean, the, the architectural recessed fixtures that we have at ETC are all plenum listed as well. So we can obviously provide the details of that. Typically, they want to know information about the warranty. Um, you know, we can provide a warranty statement that is published on, online. As Jen said, for LED fixtures, that's a, a three-year warranty. Um, but we have the ability to extend that as well. We're always looking to evaluate warranty from fixture to fixture as well. So um, as, as we move forward with our component manufacturer relationships, we're likely to be increasing this over time. But that's something that's in evaluation at the moment. Uh, the other thing they're going to want to see is a safety listing. So uh, typically in America, that would be UL or uh, ETL. And UL and ETL both have online certification directories. So we can send links from where our products have been uh, listed and provide those to the energy utility as well. So it's not just us providing documentation. What we're pointing them towards uh, those regulatory bodies so they can prove to themselves that this is a product that has been safety tested. And not just by us. And not just by us, right. Uh, or CE standard in Europe, and, and there are many others around the world. We have another tool, uh, and again, this is just a North American one, but this tool is available on the App Store, the iOS App Store. It's called ETC Site Survey. Um, sorry, Android users, but we do have a new app team at ETC, so I'm hoping in the not too distant future we can get this converted to Android as well. Um, I have something else that uh, in the meantime will help you. I'll come on to that one in a second. What the Site Survey app does is automate the process of collecting data about your current installation. And this is really from an architectural point of view. So let's say you want to do a new house lighting installation. Um, the tool itself will allow you to go around your existing installation, snap a picture of the fixture itself. You can put some information into the app about how much wattage that fixture is, how many fixtures you have, how many hours a day, days per week, uh, and so on those fixtures are being used for. Um, you input information about your energy price. So how many cents per kilowatt hour are you actually being charged for your energy to give a true reflection of uh, the return on investment time frame? Um, you know, and your facilities department are likely to know that. Um, we uh, also put information about maintenance in there because in many cases, it's not just the cost of the energy that's the expensive part. It's the cost of replacing the light bulbs in the, in, uh, in the existing installation. 
you know, getting crew into an auditorium, particularly in a super high auditorium uh, where you need plant, access plant, lifts, that kind of thing. You're talking about shutting the place down, expensive plant hire, uh, crew calls, the whole thing. It can run into thousands of dollars just to change uh, light bulbs of a couple of dollars at a time. So we plumb all that information into the app. Uh, the app then, uh, oh, we also tell it what we want to use, and it's obviously got a list of newer ETC architectural fixtures that we can replace, either on a one-for-one -one basis or, uh, uh, or you know, less or more. Um, and then the app spits out a really nice PDF report, um, formatted for, your, uh, for you and for also to present to the people internally who are really interested in how much is this thing going to cost us, um, and also something that you can present to the energy companies when putting together an application for financial assistance. Um, and ultimately what this does, it provides the photos that you've taken, information about your current installation, information about what you plan to do, and then most importantly, a financial evaluation at the end and a return on investment time frame. Now, the, how long it takes really is a case-by-case -case thing. Um, if you're running your auditorium lighting 11 hours a day, um, you know, I mean, anything between three and five years of, uh, is the average sort of return on investment time frame we see. Um, reducing energy, uh, reducing a, or replacing, I should say, an incandescent fixture into an LED fixture, typically we see anything between 65 and up to 90% reductions in energy footprint as well. So the numbers can be pretty high, and this app helps demonstrate that and helps put a case together of why it, it would be a good idea to make this change. Uh, we also have this in a new Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this is not quite ready yet. We're doing some fine-tuning now, but it, it, for those of you that don't have uh, an iOS device, um, we're going to make this available on the, on the website very soon. Uh, it kind of captures all the same information. But there are some really useful things that we've added into this, particularly um, for, for the US um, uh, participants in this. Um, and we have, you can actually put in your location. So there is a state and city drop-down box, so you put in the state. Uh, and what the state does is uh, automatically apply the published uh, cents per kilowatt hour average energy price um, for that particular state. And that's uh, published by uh, the EIA as well, the, 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 um, uh, the Department of the Government that uh, accumulate all this data. Um, and then you can also put a city in as well. And the city um, will, it's not every city in America, but it's like, you know, the three or four biggest cities in a given state. So you pick the one that's closest to you. What that will do is apply the average amount of cooling days per year that are required um, in that particular area. So when you want to consider things like, well, how much less energy am I going to do by replacing all my super hot incandescent fixtures into nice, cool, running LED fixtures, that's going to have a big knock-on onto the, the amount of um, air conditioning I'm going to need to use. So it will actually factor that in locally as well, city, you know, to the nearest available large city. So kind of a useful thing, really. And again, it's just a, another option to be able to, uh, to, to demonstrate why a project is viable if you're looking to do that kind of thing. All right, I'm going to move on to this uh, case study now. And again, thanks to the guys that put the Centennial Concert Hall um, who for allowing me to do this. Um, uh, this was going back around three, maybe just over three years we've been talking about doing this now. And it's actually been installed now for around 18 months or so. Um, and I really just want to talk about the process that those guys went through up there when they were doing it. Uh, maybe this will help you out. So the first thing they needed to do was obviously identify the incentive. We were talking about this at the beginning. Um, they worked with their local energy utility, Manitoba Hydro. Um, and actually, as it turned out, they had a very good relationship and a great account manager at Manitoba Hydro, um, who I think they, they did something with their HVAC system. Uh, there was another, scheme, another energy incentive scheme that, that they were working on at the time. And through the course of working on that program, it came up in conversation that, hey, you know, we do like lighting incentives as well. Um, and so the, the, the venue were very pleased to hear this because the auditorium, we're going to take a look at the pictures of this in a second, was in desperate need of renovation for all the reasons we were talking about just a moment ago, the maintenance issues, the, uh, the energy, amount of energy that was being used. Um, and not to mention the actual lighting of the auditorium itself wasn't at its best. There were some fairly dark spots. Uh, and the average light level itself was very low. So they were very keen to investigate this and understand what they would need to do in order to improve the situation and actually how much would the local utility be able to contribute into making this a better uh, system for the venue and obviously reduce the amount of energy that was being used. So they spoke to the guys that were there. They identified a, um, a program that was available to them. Uh, they hired the services of a local consultant, a guy called Bill Williams, a really nice guy, did a great job at um, analyzing the, um, the current installation at the time. Um, and it was a very comprehensive report that was put together um, based on what was there. Um, you can kind of make out just uh, from the picture some of the spottiness of the original 
um, of the original lighting in the auditorium. So that was one of the reasons they really wanted to improve things. But looking at the numbers there, uh, the existing lighting load was uh, over 76 kilowatts of lighting. That's a huge amount of energy for an auditorium, but actually for an auditorium this side, fairly consistent with what we would expect to see historically. Um, 200 and just under 290 existing fixtures. They had a, a, an orchestra shell as well, which was uh, obviously went onto stage, and there were a few more fixtures involved as well there that we were looking to replace. Um, and the average light levels were around one and a half to seven foot candles. So borderline dangerous <laughs> in some places because of very low light levels uh, in certain areas of the auditorium. Um, and obviously, they gave a great amount of consideration for the cost of maintenance uh, time and, um, that was being spent on that. Uh, not to mention safety. The more you have people crawling around in roof spaces to change light bulbs, especially in the more difficult to access places, uh, the greater the risk is to that person that's doing it. So uh, the, the more you can reduce that amount of uh, required maintenance, the, the safer the venue is going to be. So then we had to qualify the proposed fixtures. And uh, you remember we were talking about this alternative product qualification program. This is exactly what we had to do with Manitoba Hydro. Uh, they had some programs the way you could instantly get confirmed if you were Energy Star or DLC approved. We weren't, and that's because we were looking at using the uh, Arc System range of LED fixtures, uh, and they have a wireless transceiver built into them. Now, that's really great but if you want to install all the fixtures into a, into a space where maybe it's inaccessible to get above it and pull in DMX cable, or maybe it's a historical venue and you just don't want to start pulling apart ceilings and walls to pull in control cable. So the wireless feature is really useful, but it does mean that that quiescent load, that standby load that we were looking at, often exceeds the, the, uh, the minimums uh, or the maximums, I should say, that Energy Star and DLC um, publish. So we didn't qualify. We had to go to the, the venue or to the energy company and say, look, you know, this is still a great fixture. The project is still going to reduce the amount of energy that's required, um, but we need to get that qualified. So we sent in the fixtures uh, for evaluation, and the energy utility thoroughly evaluated it. There was lots of paperwork to fill in. We sent in our LM79 and our LM80 reports um, and a few other bits and pieces of paperwork as well. And over a period of time, we gradually moved through the products and we got them qualified. Uh, so Manitoba Hydro, in the process of doing that, it actually they have reciprocal agreements with other utilities throughout Canada, which meant if we were qualified with one, we were automatically qualified with others as well. So we, we're gradually moving around, you know, in places where we're going through this process with and, and being uh, qualified in more and more places. There's some fixtures in, ca uh, not kind of California, uh, that are in the energy rebate package that I know Jim Uphoff had spent some time working um, with the utility out there, and now we have a whole bunch of the uh, entertainment fixtures, which they're in certain circumstances happy to uh, consider as part of a program. They got an installation approval, so great. You know, we were looking at the uh, we were looking at the fixtures being installed, and before you know it, we'd uh, gone ahead and installed the best part of uh, 300 fixtures into that space. You know, we added a few extras in to uh, to cover some of those really dark spots. Um, I like this picture. Actually, this picture was taken when they had Brit Floyd in the Pink Floyd tribute band, and the haze in the auditorium just looks really cool. So I just like the picture, which is why we're looking at it now. But it really just show um, how, how great the quality of light is coming out there and how even the uh, installation is, especially when you consider what it was like before. Um, here's the really incredible thing. Look at the new power consumption, 15.8 kilowatts. It's down um, over 60 kilowatts in energy from what the previous uh, house lighting system was. So that was a huge amount of money. Um, what they generally do, what the energy utilities generally do, is take uh, a kilowatt uh, number, and then you um, times that by the number of hours it's being in, in use to give you a, like a kilowatt hour price. So in this particular case, uh, 11 hours a day was the average um, amount of um, time that the system was being used. So we were looking at 660 kilowatt hours saving per day. Um, to give you an idea, the average US domestic house consumes 900 kilowatt hours a month. So it gives you some idea of how much energy saving we're talking about here. So roughly a 20,000 kilowatt hour a month saving. Um, if here in Madison, the average energy price is 4.7 cents per kilowatt hour, so that's a saving of $940 a month on the energy bill. Not, not insignificant numbers, right? Uh, and not to mention the environmental impact we've got of saving, um, of saving all that energy. Um, the other thing these guys did was they installed a paradigm system. There was no uh, architectural lighting control solution before. Um, they were controlling their house lighting uh, from the production lighting console and from a small fader in the, on the side of the stage, which is fairly common in, in many of the existing installations. Um, obviously, adding an architectural control solution, especially like paradigm, is not cheap. 
but it provides a huge amount of flexibility. It allows us to take advantage of some of those behavioral changes we were talking about, where we can provide uh, flexibility in terms of turning off areas when they're not in use, in installing occupancy sensors, vacancy sensors, uh, buttons on the wall that people can press, and after an hour and a half between this time and this time, it will automatically turn off after maybe a, a flick warn, you know, where the lights flash to warn people they're going to turn off. So all of that stuff is going to add to the energy saving as well. Manitoba Hydro saw that and agreed with that and actually included the Paradigm system in the energy product as well. So um, not only did the venue end up with a, uh, a very advanced architectural lighting control solution, but part of that was being funded by the energy utility as well because they were saving peak demand. Project verification, um, again, you know, absolutely fair enough. The utility wanted to come in and they wanted to confirm that um, what, uh, what we said we were going to save, we actually were saving. Um, and so we, I think we estimated something like 50, 55 kilowatt reduction or 50 to 55 kilowatt reduction in power um, when we were doing all the original upfront layouts and uh, proposals. And the fact we got it over 60 kilowatts far exceeded what we originally thought we were going to do. So the energy company came in. They put some advanced um, analytical testing equipment on the incoming power just to, just to check that everything was in order and um, what we said we were doing um, was... was um, was actually what was occurring in the venue, um, and it was, so they paid the money, and they paid a, a reasonable chunk of cash in order to do this, actually up to 50% match funding they paid to do this. So when you consider the amount of energy savings on the, on the bill itself, um, coupled with you know, a check for tens of thousands of dollars, uh, that really does cut down um, and make the project very viable. A couple, couple of pictures here just of that, uh, of that Product, just uh, oh, that project, I should say, just so you can see uh, what it looked like when it was done. Um, and just for fun, uh, the guys realized that actually what you can do is um, with LED fixtures is address things on a one for one basis. So now you've got the ability to be able to zone up areas in which the um, fixtures can be used so we can turn off the lights over the, over the seating. Or you can do things like connect it to a lighting console and start to chase your auditorium lighting. <laughs> Pretty big space, that, as well, and they were running this really cool chase just for fun. I like to end on that one there. So a couple of uh, slides here on um, where can you get information on how to do this yourself. Uh, a really good resource for this, and again, this is on the resource guide that accompanies the, uh, the thumb drive or uh, obviously a uh, copy of this PowerPoint that's also there, uh, desireusa.org. This was a, a database that was set up by the University of North Carolina. Um, and uh, they started off just by cataloging the um, energy incentives that are available, not just on a federal level, but also on a state level and in, indeed a more local regionalized level, um, from energy utilities, from government, uh, everything they could possibly find went into this. Uh, actually, it was that good that the um, Department of Energy, the US Department of Energy, decided we'd like you to continue doing this, and they part from the system now, or they part from the scheme now. So it should be around for some time, hopefully. Uh, but desire, D-S-I-R-E-U-S-A.org is the web address. Again, we'll, you'll have a copy of this on your thumb drives. Have a look on there, enter the zip code, and it will tell you what's local to you, and uh, you know, persist. Speak to the people that uh, come up on there. Talk to us, we'll help you if there are information on products that you need, um, and we'll, we'll help you navigate your way through, and hopefully we'll have a, a great result on that. Uh, another resource is here. This is more to do with that section 179D stuff. And again, I don't expect you to write down this huge URL at the bottom here. Um, but um, for more information on there, you can either Google 179D or you can uh, uh, take a look at this PowerPoint presentation afterwards. Um, and that's going to give you more information on some of the energy.gov um, incentives that are available. But I recommend that desire one. That's probably one of the best ones to take a look at to begin with. All right, I think that's about it. We're actually running nicely ahead of schedule here. So um, has anybody, before we wrap up here, has anybody had any uh, experience of, uh, of attempting to apply for energy incentives? You have, yeah. Do you want to share that? How did it go? Actually, um, in our recital hall, um, I work for a college, and the college is, as a whole is doing a multi-phase um, energy assessment and rebate program with uh, Northeast Utilities. And um, they came in and did our recital hall, and we got a fixture um, to replace the house lights that was 
I would say reasonably acceptable for the way the hall gets used. Um, they wouldn't, unfortunately, they wouldn't pay for, you know, the nicer DMX controlled fixtures. What was the reason they wouldn't pay for the nicer fixtures? Um, because just the college wouldn't, the, the rebate on it to cost was the college would, wouldn't pony up the money for it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, so we didn't get something that was, was, uh, it's line dimmable, um, and it's, they're not horrible, but they're they're not great. Right. Um, so, but the way the recital hall gets used, you know, it's student recitals and that kind of thing. So it's you know the little pop on when they come on. Sure. sure. You know, and the little there's a you know the, the curve isn't very isn't very linear. And they paid for the fixtures. The, the and yeah, they paid for the fixtures. The whole thing, or fifty percent, or. Uh, I I believe it was around fifty percent. Okay. Great. Of, Fixtures and installation. Fifty percent. And yeah. and how did you find the the program? How did you get access to it? Um, this was done. This was done through our um, through the uh, our physical plant department. Um, they they have something that deals with the utility. Okay, great. So an existing relationship there with the utility, so and they found the right person. One of the things we did get out of it is um, they wouldn't they wouldn't touch the entertainment fixtures. Yeah. Um, even though they're on the architectural controller. And again, they're on they're on 16, 18 hours a day because yeah. custodial walks in, turns them on. You know, end of the day, somebody comes, somebody turns them off. Right. Um, but they did replace all of our. They did upgrade all of our um, stairway fixtures. Okay. All of the walkway fixtures as well. Um, so that was just sort of a bonus. Good experience. Where, where was this? Where were you based? Uh, Connecticut College. Okay, great. Connecticut yeah. College. All right. So that did improve that. Yeah. That was actually a fluorescent. To LED and the and the upgrade. the um, process that we were talking about earlier here was that fairly consistent with what you experienced? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I was glad that my research is <laughs> is looking good here, right? Um, one of the other things that ETC does have, if you're in a position where you're looking at not using our fixtures, um, we do have an applications engineering department that keeps a database of different fixture types and how well they perform. If you have ETC dimmers that they're going on. Um, as well as the ability to test something if we haven't tested it already. Very good. Okay, well, I think unless there are any other questions, anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Yep, question here, yeah. Um, so I work for an educational institution. If we were looking at doing a bond proposal, could we also tack on some of the funding from the electronic or the electric company to help with that, or would that just be all on the bond because of that process? Could you tack on, uh, say that again. Explain so um, a bond proposal, like raising funds from the community based on taxes, but could we also take money for LED house lights from the energy company too? Oh, I would see. That be a one yeah, so could you essentially uh, you know, use an existing program you've got for raising money and, and double, double tap right. that with a right. possible incentive from the energy? I think that's going to that's gonna depend on the terms of the program of this particular energy company. Um, so you'd have to do some research really on your, where are you from? Michigan. Michigan, okay. So, yeah, I would, you know, call your local energy company in Michigan and explain the situation. Maybe they can have some programs that are, maybe they would do an energy incentive uh, funding program for you, but it wouldn't be for the full amount. Maybe they would say, well, we'll match fund. We would match fund everything up to 50% of the scheme. You kind of already raised funds for 20%, so we'll just do 30% for you instead. And, and possibly that would be something they would look to offer. I don't know, but that would be it, my guess. Um, one of the people that we had in the previous class, uh, when they had their incentive, uh, they were able to use their labor, labor cost for their salaried people as part of what they were contributing toward the price of the project as well. So something to consider and ask about. Another question back there, yeah. You um, had mentioned the Section 179D stuff, which is not in action now, but may come back. And you said it's for government buildings. Do you mean federal, or do you mean city, or like how broad is that? Uh, you know, I don't really know. The question was, does uh, 179D apply to federal or, uh, or local government? Uh, I actually don't really know the answer to that. I'd have to research it for you and have a look. But we can talk about that afterwards. And uh, I mean, fundamentally, we need the, 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 the bill to come back in. But right. uh, 
Um, you know, it's, they've, they've, it's, it's quite interesting. There are four bills outstanding. One is just to reinstate it to the end of 2017. I think it will be the end of 2017 before they actually get to that one. But there's another one in place uh, to, to reinstate it for, I think, uh, three years, and another one to reinstate it for five years. So I would expect maybe one of those to get through, and, um, and at that point they may change the terms of it a little bit. Yeah. Do you know, does that qualify for management? Com I mean, it would have to qualify for the management company. Because we, the organization I work for actually manages a lot of performance venues for that are owned by the state and city. Okay. Uh, I would imagine it would qualify for a management company, yeah. I think uh, ultimately the, what we're looking at here is to reduce our energy footprint, our peak demand and energy footprint. And irrespective of the route it takes in order to, to achieve that goal, um, you know, that is the goal. So um, I'm pretty certain that uh, multiple venues grouped through a central management resource do qualify for that. Yeah. David. I'm reading on the website right now for uh, 179B that it's federal, state, and local government properties. Federal, state, and local government properties, 179B. Look at that. I didn't even have to follow up after this. <laughs> Thank you. So do you have any comments on strategies of how to talk with either the, the companies or administrations about when we want to approach changing out fixtures when they say, oh, well, these LED lights are cheaper than these LED lights, but it's the cost versus performance. You know, like just overall, like house light fixtures, the overall dimmable quality of the house light fixtures that we're not losing the artistic integrity. Yeah. Do you have any advice or comments about how to navigate the cost versus performance? Yeah, you know, the question was, do we have advice on how to navigate cost versus performance of fixtures? Um, you know, again, this is a case-by-case -case thing, but it really comes down to suitability of use. Uh, you, you've got to, in some cases, if you can do this, um, you know, invite the person from the utility company to come down and understand what we're looking at. Um, I've even seen cases in the past where we've done LED shootouts in auditoriums and said, this is what we currently have. We'd like to use this one. There's a couple of other fixtures available that, you know, you would like us to use, and this is the reason why we don't want to use them. Um, you know, it, it varies, again, case-by-case, case, but um, there may be... There may be considerations such as going back to the ARC system, which has the wireless built in. It may not be practical to install um, uh, another type of LED fixture which doesn't have that wireless built in. It may not be practical to start ripping apart walls and ceilings in order to be able to actually use this fixture. So, um, you know, in that particular scenario, maybe you could take an argument back to them and say, well, we really need to use this type of fixture for auditorium use uh, because it's got the wireless feature built in. Um, it may just be as simple as, you know, when we need a, a, quite a, a dimming, uh, you know, a premium quality dimming fixture for auditorium use because in the theater, the auditorium lighting is a part of the experience. And so we need that premium quality dimming all the way down to zero, just like we have now with incandescent fixtures. So I think it would be fair to say to these people, you're not asking for anything above and beyond what is required in terms of suitability of use. You're just saying we're actually looking to provide the same experience we have now in terms of incandescent fixture but at a, a smaller energy footprint. And I think that's probably how I would uh, negotiate that. You know, again, it's going to come down to the person you speak to and the, uh, and the relationship you have with them. But good point. Thank you. Add into that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we, when, when they did our recital hall, um, that was a big part of it, um, is we did not do our main auditorium. Right. Um, because they were not willing to go with a, suit, with a suitable fixture. Yeah. So... Um, you know, we basically told management to just, just stay out. Yeah. You know, if you're not going to go to that level or that, you know, for, for where that that's, is required, yeah. then don't touch them. Yeah, you've got to do what's the right thing for the space, you know, yeah. and what is reasonable for use in the space, really. Uh, and again, you know, that would be a separate proposal, I guess, to take to, to the utility company when considering a product to use. Yeah. All right, okay, well, I think uh, we just about hit four o'clock here in Madison, so um, I think we can wrap it up now. And um, thank you for everybody uh, for your time today. Thank you for those that contributed to our session. We appreciate that. Uh, thank you to everybody online who's been watching. I'm sure there are millions of people watching. Um, and um, we'll call it, we'll call it a, a day at that. And thank you for attending Q. If you want to do a class feedback as well on your app, uh, I keep, always forget to mention that. We have, do we have forms? I think there may be forms at the back. If not, you can do it through the app. But thanks again. Oh, the forms are here if you want the paper version.